You're listening to episode 56 of Liz's Healthy Table. Looking for a healthy new way to feed your family without the hassle and hype? Welcome to Liz's Healthy Table, where your host, registered dietitian nutritionist Liz Weiss, serves up fresh and flavorful recipes with a tasty side of science, good nutrition, and fun. Are you and your family ready for some wholesome food that tastes great, too? Don't change that dial. Your food adventure starts here. Welcome to the podcast, everyone. Happy summer. I hope you're all having a great time, taking a much needed break from the school year. I, for one, have been very busy, but it's a good kind of busy. I had my mother-in-law visiting from England and my brother-in-law. I had Josh and his girlfriend and Simon at my house. So lots of cooking, lots of laundry, lots of fun times together. So that's been kind of keeping me pretty occupied. But here we are with episode 56. And the topic today is grains. And this is a show that I've been wanting to do for a while because there's a lot of myths out there about grains, a lot of misconceptions. What's a refined grain? What's a complex carbohydrate? How can we fit both of them into a nourishing and delicious diet? So on today's show, we'll be talking about all sorts of recipes, everything from pasta with oven-dried tomatoes to trendy and playful grain bowls also known as Buddha Bowls and Nourish Bowls. My guest is Christine Cochran. She is the Executive Director of the Grain Foods Foundation. Christine, also known on the playground by fellow moms as the Bread Lady, is joining me to slice into all the confusion on the playground and beyond about the role of grains in a healthy diet. So we're going to answer your questions about gluten-free about GMOs. And by the way, no, wheat is not a GMO product. We're going to talk about how to read labels. And of course, you know, lots of recipe ideas. I do want to give a quick shout out to Melissa Joy Dobbins. She is a fellow dietitian. She is the host of the Sound Bites podcast. And on episode 120, a fairly recent show on Melissa's podcast, she interviewed Glenn Geyser. Now, Glenn is a researcher, and he's done some research on refined grains and how they are often guilty by association. They get a bad rap. So Melissa digs into that topic on her show, and I encourage you to check that out. I'll put a link to Melissa's show in my show notes. Before we get started, don't forget to join Liz's podcast posse, that's my closed group on Facebook. Anyone can join. And if you go to the podcast subpage on Liz's Healthy Table.com, in the right hand side, you'll see a little button there that takes you over to the podcast posse. Liz's Healthy Table is brought to you by my friends at superhealthykids.com, your one stop shop for recipes, meal plans, cooking videos, and tips for feeding kids of all ages. The show is also brought to you by the Parents on Demand Network. This is an app that's filled with parenting podcasts like Preschool and Beyond. I was a guest on Mike's show a while back talking about family dinner, but he tackles all sorts of topics relating to raising preschoolers. And we know those issues are very different from, say, raising teenagers, which was kind of where I was a couple of years ago. It's a great show. Be sure to to tune in. And if you want to learn more about Parents on Demand, you can check them out at parentsondemand.com. Okay, so I don't know about you, but I am ready to bust some myths about grains, refined carbs, and wheat. Hey, Christine, welcome to the podcast. Hi, thank you for having me. So excited to be here. I'm excited, too, because there's a lot of, you know, myths out there and misconceptions about grains and carbohydrates. But before we debunk a lot of those myths, I was hoping you can just tell everybody a little bit about yourself. You work at the Grain Foods Foundation. You have some kids. Like, tell everybody, let's get to know you a little bit. So give us the Christine story. Well, I'm happy to. My name is Christine Cochran. I serve as the executive director of the Grain Foods Foundation. My husband and I have been married for almost 17 years and have three children. 
We have um, nine-year-old boy-girl twins and a six-year-old son. So we have a very busy house. And we most recently decided that it wasn't busy enough and that we needed to add a six-month-old German Shepherd puppy to our Mm. brood. So we are very enlivened by that (laughs) and very happy to have four extra feet in the house. So... You know, we keep an active, busy home life. Both my husband and I obviously work. And so, you know, figuring out how to feed everybody and the time frame they need to be fed is foremost on our minds. So I love your podcast for that. Always (laughs) very inspiring. As far as my personal background, I think one of the things that people don't know is that I came to nutrition actually with an agricultural background. So I studied agricultural economics at the University of Missouri. I traveled and spent time working on an organic farm in Costa Rica. I've spent time studying and working on farms in the Czech Republic back in the mid 90s. So I worked for a time at the U.S. Embassy in Nigeria, working large on agricultural issues. And so I really come into it with a deep understanding of production agriculture. And one of the things I always wanted to do was better understand the nutrition side. And so I found my way to the Grain Foods Foundation about six years ago, where I have really just enjoyed immersing myself into the subject, learning about it, and coming to appreciate the complexity and the importance of nutrition. So, Christine, the Grain Foods Foundation, can you just tell everybody a little bit about it? And I will tell everybody listening that Christine and I met at a conference back in January. And so I just was really interested in having you on the podcast because there's just, as I said at the top of the show, so much confusion about grains and carbohydrates. So tell everybody a little bit about the Grain Foods Foundation. And then we're just going to like dig into questions that came in from listeners and just kind of setting the record straight. Yeah, the Grain Foods Foundation was established back in 2004. So we've been around for 15 years. Our mission is to provide science-based messaging on the nutritional value of grain-based foods. That is our mission. We are funded largely by industry on a voluntary basis. So the companies that support us believe in our mission and want to foster deeper dialogue and understanding around the nutritional benefits of grains. And so, as you may know, Liz, but your listeners may not, we have a separate scientific advisory board who helps us understand the science, helps craft our messaging and what we put out there. We work with the dietary guidelines at USDA. We are what they call a strategic partner. You know, so we're very much just reaching out to respectable academic institutions, governmental bodies, really trying to understand the science and then bring it out to people like you and to consumers as well. So when we talk about grain foods, I think a lot of people think about wheat, but there's so much more to the world of grains than just wheat. So can you just like define grains for us? Like what falls under that umbrella? It does definitely includes wheat, but it also includes corn, rice, oats, farro, quinoa, teff, etc. The list kind of goes on and on. So grains in general is very encompassing. Wheat is the one that gets talked about a lot because it is the largest grain consumed, not just in the United States, but around the world. One little bit of trivia I like to share with people is that wheat, rice, and corn provide 60% of the world's calories and half of the world's protein. Whoa, that's a real big surprise. Yes. And one of the things is that Grains, if you take them together, are the main source of protein, especially in countries like up to 72% of the protein in Pakistan, whereas in the United States, it's only 16%. Mm. So that U.S. diet is different than other parts of the world. But even in the United States, it probably provides more protein to the diet than most people even Mm. think. That's so cool. And, you know, a lot of people over the last 10, 15 years have started to follow gluten-free diets for a variety of reasons. So if you're following a gluten-free diet, you could still eat grains, right? Oh, absolutely. I mean, because... <laughs> Let's <yeah>. set the <laughs> record straight on that. So there's which grains are gluten-free that people can enjoy? Okay. So let's do talk about like the gluten-free grains, but then I also want to go back and clarify a little bit about wheat. So gluten-free grains, and this is not a, I'm sure I will leave something off the list. So this is not exhaustive, but they do include amaranth, buckwheat, corn, millet, oats, 
quinoa, rice, sorghum, teff, and wild rice. Now, I do want to put an asterisk by oats. If you are following a gluten-free diet because you have a medical condition, you need to be careful with oats. And just check the labels to make sure that they were processed in a gluten-free facility. Because of the way oats are grown, transported, and utilized in other channels in America, contamination can happen. Mm -hmm. So just you know, oats are something to be really careful of. The other thing that people don't always know is, so if you're following a gluten-free diet for lifestyle reasons, you might not know that wheat isn't just bread and pasta. It is also spelt farro, durum, bulgur, and semolina. So, you know, a farro salad is going to have gluten in it. Mm Mm-hmm. Sure. Even though it's in a different form. So that's just something people don't always know is that wheat isn't just milled into flour. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I want to get back to wheat as well, because when people hear about wheat, you know, it gets a bad rap quite often. And I want to dispel something right now. And that is that wheat is not a GMO product, but people think sometimes that it is. So can you talk about that? Oh, absolutely. You are correct. Wheat has never been genetically modified. There is no genetically modified wheat available if you wanted to grow it, (laughs) but you're not going to be able to go to the seed store and buy it. A couple of years ago, actually just a little over a year ago, I had the privilege of going into a seed bank in Mexico at a facility called Simit. And they, like you get to go down, you was put on special gear and you go down into a basement facility and you walk in amongst all of the various forms of wheat that go back 150 years. So, you know, not only has it not been genetically modified, but there are facilities around the world where we are cataloging and maintaining various wheat varieties, you know, for over 150 years. So in the event we need to breed different characteristics, those are still available to Mm -hmm. us. So there are alternatives to GMO in the wheat space. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the next time you go to Mexico or on one of those really cool adventures, can I go with you? Like, will you (laughs) hire me as your PA? (laughs) I won't even charge you. Like, I really want to go on that trip. (laughs) <laughs> yes, I, I mean, I have to say it was a personal goal of mine. So when I got invited down there, I mean, I immediately said yes. And I have to say it did, met all of my expectations. It was very, very fun. And it's fun to see what they're doing because above ground, right, and facilities like this, they don't just store the seeds. They're utilizing them and working to solve real problems, oftentimes related to pests or climate change issues, but also nutrition issues. So I highly encourage courage going and you can certainly come with me in the next one. Thank you. I'm going to hold you to it. We'll be in touch. So (laughs) when we look at grains, right, we know that they are carbohydrates, they're carbs and carbs also have this bad rap. People always say, I eat too many carbs. I got to cut back on carbs, but not all carbs are created equal. I mean, there's fruits, there's vegetables, beans have carbohydrates, uh, milk has carbohydrate. So can you just talk a little bit about grains as members of the carbohydrate group and sort of where they fit in? And then we're going to dig into refined grains and whole grains and all that good stuff. But where do grains fit into this like world of carbohydrates? Well, they are definitely carbohydrates, and they are an important part of a balanced diet. As we talk about diets of moderation, right, should include grains, unless you have a medical condition, in which case they can still oftentimes include grains. I mean, grains provide you, just generally speaking, with fiber. They provide you with B vitamins, which are really important for metabolism. So your body's ability to utilize the energy that it has. It's important for brain activity and development. And then they provide a lot of minerals as well. Like so kind of micronutrients that we might not always be talking about, like iron and magnesium and phosphorus and potassium. So all things that are really, really important in the diet, grains can be a source of. Christine, can you just describe or tell us what is a whole grain? I'm doing quotation marks. What's a whole grain exactly? Liz, I love starting with the most basic question. So what is a whole grain? Well, a grain is made up of three parts, the outer bran, the inner endosperm, and the germ, which is like the heart of the grain. A whole grain includes all three of these parts, whether intact such as brown rice, or ground into flour and then prepared in foods, such as whole wheat bread. 
So you mentioned rice, brown rice, right? So you could have a whole grain. It might be rice. You can have a whole grain. It might be wheat. It could be farro. The sky's the limit, right? But it has to have the germ, the germ, the bran, the endosperm. Simple, right? Simple and correct. Okay. So then what's a refined grain? What's the difference? That too is a great question because you see that word all the time in the grocery store, as well as in the news, in the media. Refined grains contain only the endosperm. In other words, the starchy part that makes up about 80% of the grain. This part of the grain is a concentrated source of carbohydrates and protein. That's the part people don't always know, as well as some vitamins and minerals. Okay, so we've got this refined grain. It's got the germ removed and the bran removed. And as a result, we often see this term enriched so that the refined grain, let's say we're buying white bread or white pasta, we see this word enriched. What does that mean? Yes. Now, this is a word I would love for your listeners to key in on a little bit more because this is really what distinguishes white flour from white flour. Okay, so enriched grains, which you will see on packaging, especially packaging for breads, buns, rolls, those sorts of things. Enriched grains are refined grains that have vitamins and minerals added after the milling process. Most refined grains are enriched. This means certain B vitamins like thiamine, riboflavin, niacin and folic acid, as well as iron are added after processing. These grains have been fortified with nutrients that address specific public health needs like neural tube birth defects. So what's the difference then between an enriched grain and a fortified grain? And tell me, I'm going to take a stab at it because I think I know. So an enriched grain means you're adding nutrients back in that you lost during that milling process. Fortified means they're adding nutrients into that refined grain that weren't there in the first place. You mentioned folic acid, which is a nutrient that reduces the risk of neural tube defects. So is that the the true difference? The enriched means they're adding back what was lost. The fortified is kind of like they're enhancing it, if you will. Well, I think context matters. So what you describe is classically true. However, when you're in the grocery store and you're looking at, you know, a bag of hot dog buns and it says, enriched on that. That isn't just adding back in what has been lost in the process. It's also fortified, right? So some of those vitamins that I rattled off, they are never naturally occurring. Folic acid is not naturally occurring in wheat, but we add it in because it's a great conduit to solve a public health crisis. So in the bread aisle, the word enriched means enriched the way you defined it, but it also includes fortification. Okay. So rather than getting caught up in all of those terms, suffice it to say that refined grains have a lot of great things going on, but they often get a bad rap. And I will say that not, just like with fat, not all fats are created equal, not all refined grains are created equal. So just talk a little bit about refined grains and the types of refined grains we should be choosing more of and those that are a little bit more indulgent that we might want to limit. Yeah, I think that is a really good question because, as you know, USDA recommends that we eat six servings of grains a day. That's the general recommendation. You have to you know, look at your own individual diet and assess your needs. But in general, six servings of grain, and they recommend half of them be whole. That means the other half should be classically defined as refined. But when we at the Grain Foods Foundation think about refined grains, we think about them as being broken into two categories, that of staples and indulgent foods. Staples are foods like bread, cereal, pasta, and rice. Indulgent grain foods are things like cookies, cakes, and pies. Embedded in USDA's recommendations is a suggestion that we limit indulgent grain foods as a means of eating more nutrient-dense and lower-calorie diet. They're not suggesting that we necessarily limit staples. Some folks like to think of refined grains only as the indulgent foods. And yes, these foods are often heavy in sugar and fat. However, staple grains, when eaten in recommended portions, as we always have to say, provide nutrition and energy without necessarily loading up on fat and sugar. Mm -hmm. So when you're making pasta for dinner, if you've eaten a lot of whole grains in your day and you're like, I really want to go for that 
penne pasta, you know, the white pasta. Like you don't need to feel guilty about it. There's a lot of good nutrition in there, right? Correct. That is absolutely true. And the great thing about pasta, pasta is a good example, because what do we typically couple it with? Vegetables, Mm. right? You know, whether you're adding tomatoes, which are in season now, right, or others, like depending on what you like. Are you adding in asparagus or broccoli, spinach? These are, pasta is a great conduit for getting more vegetables into your diet. And let me tell you what I'm making for dinner tonight. So I'm going to make pasta. Just this morning, I slow roasted tomatoes in the oven. So listen up, everybody. I took these little cherry tomatoes or grape tomatoes, sliced them in half lengthwise. I tossed them in a little bit of olive oil, kosher salt and pepper, a little bit of fresh thyme. And then I put them cut side down on a parchment lined baking sheet. And I popped them in the oven for three hours at 250 degrees. So these little babies come out of the oven and they're so sweet and they're a little bit crispy. So instead of sun-dried tomatoes, these are just slow roasted oven dried tomatoes and they're so good. So I'm going to be adding that to our pasta tonight and along with a little pesto as well. So there's like this whole world, right? When it comes to pasta, I feel like it is this like canvas for so many good dinners, so many delicious dinners. Oh, yes, absolutely. What do you like to add to your pasta? What would be like your favorite? Oh, well, that's a tough one because I really do enjoy pasta. But if I, if you're going to force me to have a favorite, <laughs> I love the seafood-based pasta. So I love to add in, I live in Washington, D.C., so adding in a little bit of crab with some asparagus, toss in some basil and mint. And then I like to finish it with, you know, something very simple, just like lemon juice. Mm, that sounds good. And in case anybody hears in the background drilling, my husband, I was just telling this to you, Chris. He's been in the basement with my son, Simon, and they're putting walls up. It's like a good male bonding thing, you know? Simon's learning a lot because Tim's very handy. But I told him 10 times, I'm about to interview Christine. Could you just kind of hold off on the drill work and the hammering? But they ignored me. So if anybody hears drilling, that explains why. I hope you don't hear it, Christine. I hope it's not like messing with your mojo. (laughs) (laughs) No, not at all. Okay. This is my life. All right. As much as I plan, right? Right. So, all right. So we're walking into the grocery store and we see whole wheat bread in the bread aisle and we assume it's 100% whole wheat or 100% whole grain, but it might not be. So when you're reading labels and let's say, you know, half your grains are whole grains, you want to get that whole wheat bread. How do you know for sure? that it's 100% whole wheat? What do you look for on the label? This is a great question. And in my personal world, I'm often known as the bread lady. And so when Mm. I'm on the playground at my kid's school, this is probably the most commonly asked question of me. So let's take a minute with this one because I don't ever want the bread aisle to be intimidating or confusing for anyone. That is not the objective. So (laughs) What I encourage everyone to do is if you're looking at this and you're confused, look at the ingredients listed. Let's go right to that ingredient list. If the first ingredient listed, so you don't have to read far, contains the word whole, such as whole wheat flour or whole oat, it is likely that the product is predominantly whole grain. Okay, simple. (laughs) <laughs> or it might say 100% whole grain or 100% whole wheat. That's the other thing I look for too. Yes. Okay. Well, and you're the bread lady. Who knew? I'm the bread lady. You didn't tell me this in our pre-interview, Christine. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry I didn't share that. Back in the day when before nutrition was really popular, my friend Laura used to call me the nutrition nudnik. She's like, you're such a downer on nutrition. Meanwhile, now everybody's like, you're a dietitian. Oh my gosh, I'm eating this. I'm eating that. And how times change. So you're the bread lady. I am the nutrition nudnik in the past. No longer. I'm very popular now. So let's just talk about breakfast, lunch, and dinner real quick. And just tell me how whole grains or grains in general, how grain foods can help us eat a healthy diet at breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So let's have it three times a day. You know, we got our six servings, but let's hit up three right now. So what would you do at breakfast, lunch, and dinner to incorporate healthy whole grains? This is a great question. And I wish this was the question I was being asked on the playground. Ah. (laughs) 
we've all been programmed, right, to understand that we need to get protein at every meal. But we don't really spend a lot of time talking about why we need grains at every meal. Grain foods provide energy. They provide protein, fiber, and many nutrients that fuel our bodies throughout a very busy day. So cereal and yogurt or toast with a nut butter are great breakfast options just to get you going. All right. A sandwich at lunchtime is an easy idea for refueling midday, making sure that the ingredients between the bread are also nutritious like the bread is. That's important. And then a pasta with lean protein and vegetables at dinner is a smart way to end the day and to prepare your body for another busy day tomorrow. Mm-hmm. And I will say, too, just so everybody knows who's listening, that on the blog, I have done a roundup, a recipe roundup featuring over 30 grain bowl recipes. So like these nourish bowls, Buddha bowls that you hear about, whatever you want to call them, but power bowls. But I sent out this message to a bunch of dietitians I know who blog. And I said, what's your best grain bowl recipe? And so I've got grain bowls with brown rice, with farro, with quinoa, This roundup is incredible, so delicious. And so if you are like wanting ideas for grain bowls, which are great, I think, at lunch or dinner, then I'll give you a link in the show notes so everybody can check that out. So let's do this little lightning round. I'm going to challenge you right now with whole wheat couscous. So let's say you're at the store. I was at Trader Joe's the other day. I grabbed whole wheat couscous and it cooks up in like five minutes. Thank you very much. Unlike the barley, it takes a while. So what might you do with that whole wheat couscous? Give us some recipe inspiration. Oh, this is a great one. I'm so glad you asked me about this one. So just to weave in a bit of personal narrative here, my husband and I years ago took a trip to Tunisia where we did a trek through the Sahara Desert. And I promise this gets back to couscous. <laughs> On that journey, we had couscous almost every meal because it cooks up so well. So like one of my favorite ways to cook whole wheat couscous is to take it, mix it in with tomatoes, bell peppers, onions, garlic. And then I add in some broth and make it into a bit of a soup with lots of like ginger and other spices just to give it some flavor. And it just takes me back to that trip. So personally, that's what I would do with couscous. It's really versatile. It's not often in the U.S. eaten in the soup form, but give it a try. It's delicious. Mm -hmm. I actually made it the other day and, you know, cooks up in like five minutes. And then I added some olive oil and lemon juice and lemon zest. And I had diced up some carrots and I just sauteed up those carrots with some green onion. And I added some cumin and coriander and I then added the carrots to the couscous and I then added some mint and basil and it was so good. And it was just like this really yummy side dish, a little grain side dish. And that doesn't take that long to make. And you could also do that as a foundation for a bowl meal if, again, you're obsessing with bowl meals. So whole wheat couscous. What about rice? What about something like basmati rice, because to me, basmati rice has a really distinct flavor beyond like regular everyday rice. So what would you do with basmati? Well, there are so many options. So basmati is one of my favorites as well because of its unique flavor. I feel like it really adds to almost any dish. I have some sitting in my fridge waiting to be used this week. And to be honest, I'm probably gonna turn it into a um, fried rice dish. I love to get out my paella pan, put the basmati rice in it. I love being able to control the amount of oil that I use. I load it up with ginger and garlic, carrots and onions, peas, some soy sauce. You mentioned fresh lemon with your couscous. I actually do that and some cilantro in with my fried rice. And then if we have um, any from our taco night tonight, if we have any leftover chicken, I'll probably chop some of that up, toss it up and have a great dinner. Mm, And we are talking on Taco Tuesday. So there you go. You are quite the cook, Christine. See, we're learning a lot about you. You're a farmer and you're a very good cook. Yes. Well, come over. I would love to cook a meal for you. I would love it. And I want to share one more idea because I love pasta. And the other day I made just a really quick, simple minestrone soup. And so I sauteed up some onion. And I think I used green onion because I had it in the house onion and carrot. Oh, and mushrooms. I diced up some mushroom, chopped them up and sauteed that up in olive oil. And then I added 
vegetable broth and chickpeas. And I added some of those little Ditalini pasta. Oh, and I added a can of tomato sauce, like a 15 ounce can. And I just sort of let it bubble, bubble, bubble till the pasta was cooked through. And then I had this really hearty, yummy minestrone. And what I did was, and this is a little tip for our listeners. If you have a hunk of Parmesan in your fridge, you can cut the rind off and just throw it in the soup. And the rind adds like the nice umami. That's that fifth taste sensation. It adds this umami flavor to the soup. And then at the end, I just pull out the rind. Oh, and I also add fresh sprigs of thyme. So that's where you're making this plant-based soup and you're adding the little ditalini pasta, like a half cup. So it just adds this nice texture to the soup and it's hearty and filling. Oh, and I also added some Swiss chard leaves that I chopped up, or you could add baby kale or baby spinach. You just dump whatever's in there, you know, whatever you have in the fridge, just dump it in. And it was this really yummy minestrone soup with pasta. Sounds delicious. I would, the only thing I'd add to that is I often keep my Parmesan rinds and I keep them in a bag in the freezer. And that way, when you're making that dish, if you don't have it in the fridge, you can pull it out of the freezer and and plop that in. Mm, This is so good. We're going to talk for another hour. So sit back, people. We got no, I'm just kidding. There's so many ideas. And what I want everybody to understand as you and I are sort of brainstorming is that there's so many applications and recipes and ways to incorporate grains, whole or staple refined grains into the diet. And it's sort of like the sky's the limit. And it's like this world of flavors that we've just sort of like globe trotted with all of these quick, simple, we went to Italy, we went to Tunisia, we were everywhere. So thank you. Thank you. So Christine, is there anything else you want to say or share about grains that we haven't touched on? Because I'm hoping we've talked about the nutritional benefits and I'm hoping we dispelled myths and misconceptions. And I hope people can enjoy a variety of grains happily without thinking twice about them. Well, I do too. I think that, you know, one of the struggles we have is you hear a lot of negative things, but deep down, we love them, right? You describe grains as social. They're absolutely social. And not only in terms of on the plate, but in terms of the meals we share with people. So I would just encourage your listeners to think twice about grains because they offer so much opportunity, both in terms of the meals that you can conjure up, as well as the nutrients that they provide to you. Well, thank you, Christine, so much for coming on the show. I appreciate it. Thank you, Liz. It was a pleasure. And I would like to thank all of my listeners for tuning in today. If you head on over to the show notes, we're going to give you links to a lot of the recipes we talked about. If you love the show, tell a friend about it, post a review on iTunes, Stitcher Radio, wherever you get your podcasts. And as always, thanks for listening to Liz's Healthy Table.